Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this plenary session on infrastructure renewal for greener and more inclusive transport. I'm Melinda Crane, and it is a great pleasure to be back in the midst of the transport community and to see so many familiar faces amongst you. Yesterday's opening plenary, plenary provided a clear reminder of transport's crucial role in the transition to greener and more inclusive growth. It also called attention to the magnitude and complexity of the challenge, and that's what we want to focus, focus in on today in greater detail. As they move to renew existing infrastructure, decision makers, whether they be on the policy side or from industry, must balance four not always easily compatible goals. Not just emissions reduction, but also accessibility and safety for users, as well as economic efficiency. And they must do so in the face of significant constraints and risks. Uncertain funding, unpredictability in regard to the direction of technological development, and the nature and magnitude of climate change. All of which magnify the problem of path dependencies in a sector with long lead times, with high capital requirements, the choices that we make now can lock us in to models for a very long time to come. How are policymakers and industry leaders addressing these challenges? That's what we will hear now from a very eminent panel with representatives of both industry and government. May I please ask the panel members to join me here on stage? It is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists, beginning here to my right with Doris Leuthard. She is federal counselor in the government of Switzerland and heads the federal department of the Environment, Transport, Energy, and Communications. She's also vice president of the Swiss Confederation and was previously at the helm of the Department of Economic Affairs. A very warm welcome to you. And on my other side, Angela Gittens is Director General of Airports Council International, which is the worldwide association of airports. With a career in the aviation industry spanning more than two decades, she has held top executive positions at three of the largest US airports, Miami, Atlanta, and San Francisco. Great that you can be with us today. And over here on the uh, outside of the panel, Oscar Dubuin is president of the World Road Association. He's a civil engineer by training, spent most of his professional career in the public sector, mainly at the Mexican Secretary of Communications and Transport, where he served as Undersecretary of Infrastructure. Great to see you again. And on this side, Jean-Pierre Lubinou is Director General of the International Union of Railways, UIC, which is the Worldwide Association of the Rail Sector. He previously served as Chairman and CEO of the French Railway, SNCF, and uh, also, uh, sorry, SNCF International and SNCF Director of International Development. And finally, a pleasure to have with us Karina Rigby. She's Vice President of Business Development and Strategy at Siemens Mobility with responsibility for rail and road products, solutions and services. She's a material technology engineer and she has held various COO, CEO level positions with multinational companies before joining Siemens. So welcome to you also. I'd like to start out by talking in general about prioritization, about how you identify strategic priorities in view of those various uncertainties that I listed earlier. And let us reserve climate change uncertainty perhaps for the next round of discussion and focus in now on the various other unpredictabilities that you face as decision makers. And of course, there are plenty of those surrounding both technological development and also funding issues. So I'll start perhaps with Switzerland, which is a world champion, as we all know, when it comes to sustainable long-term transport policy making with a very strong intermodal focus. You've got a dense rail network, which of course does require extensive maintenance and renewal. So what can we learn from Switzerland in terms of identifying those strategic priorities? 
Sorry, good afternoon. Uh, I think what for governments for Switzerland and I'm, I'm sure also for other countries is very decisive that you have an assessment about mobility in the next 15, 20 years. So we have quite a good idea where will people live, where we will have how much traffic, uh, so capacities uh, available for the future, where will people work. So the assessment actually is an assessment of the population, living conditions and uh, labor conditions. And then you have a, an idea, okay, what means this on infrastructure? And then, second, uh, for us it's important that we have a, a philosophy that uh, in every region of Switzerland you have access to a transport system, to public services. But this means in, in rural areas, public transportation is on roads. It's maybe a bus system or, uh, well, some kind of public transportation on roads. And between cities, we have a clear priority that this is the railway system. And another third example is for us important, the transportation of freight. Here we have the transition from road to uh, uh, railway, which uh, is also a huge investment in railway infrastructure because this is more effective, consumes less energy and is in time. And with roads who are more and more, uh, well, we have more congestions, so time is also an element of our priorities that the consumer, the economy has an infrastructure available which helps the economy, which keeps you to move from A to B in time. And so that's how we plan our investments. Sustainable, because we think really energy, environment protection, this must be an element of our priorities. And services to every citizen, not only in the urban areas, all over the country. And uh, just a word, if you would, on that uncertainty factor that I mentioned earlier. Um, Switzerland, as I, as I mentioned, really world model in terms of long-term planning, but technological change is very rapid. How does that pose challenges and how do you deal with that? Yes, I think uncertainty increases for the moment. So um, we have quite a clear view about 2030. Our investment planning goes up to 2040. But in my uh, philosophy, I think Switzerland will be built when it comes to infrastructure in 20, 25 years. So uh, it means for the next 15 to 20 years, investments in real infrastructure and then using intelligent systems, using then the, the possibilities of digitalization to use their existing infrastructure in a more smarter, uh, more efficient way. So uh, we have some kind of two periods uh, uh, in parallel and digitalization may not help you to have enough capacities. It, it helps you a little bit to, that it's, the organization is better. You can use the surface for roads, perhaps for free lines. You can use airports also in a smarter way. You can use also the railway system with, with, with uh, well, delays of two minutes instead of five minutes. So this will help you to organize and manage the transport systems more effective, more intelligent. But in my way, that's something in parallel we develop now, but it will not help you in the in next years to have an answer of increased mobility of persons and, and, and goods. Thank you very much. Let me go now to you, Mr. Dubuin, and ask you to perhaps address the question of strategic prioritizing in the face of uncertainty, wearing two different hats, because of course you are both a former policymaker and now uh, the head of a sectoral association, World Road Association. So putting on that policymaker's hat, if you would please first, Mexico does, current, does want to be a global player when it comes to trade. The government has adopted an ambitious national infrastructure program, but the World Economic Forum gives Mexico only a middling ranking in terms of the competitiveness of, of infrastructure. Where do you see the main challenges and necessities for your country? It's on. Well, with the policymaker's hat, uh, I would say that, that today the, the situation that um, a country such as Mexico faces in terms of, of transport is a huge reliance on road transportation. 
We do have a very important railway system. However, it's geared to attend freight. But passenger, uh, railway passenger transportation is lacking. We practically do not have it. So given this very large dependency on the road sector, what happens is that you have to keep the road sector working in order for the economy to keep working and to, for the country to keep moving. So uh, basically what happens here is that the, the priority or the, there is a huge need in, in investing in road maintenance. Uh, road uh, also increases in capacity, especially around the large uh, cities and towns, because that's where most of the population growth occurs. And, well, th that's, let's say, the, the structural component of the transportation system. In addition to this, you definitely have uh, long-term goals in terms of energy, in terms of lowering emissions, in terms of coping with climate change. So that leads you into more uh, non-road investments. And examples such as the ones that you, that you mentioned, uh, railway transportation for passengers, it's starting to be, to be developed. Uh, today there is a line between two cities, Mexico City and Toluca, which is under construction. This will be the first intercity uh, modern railway line to be built. And it's an example of uh, investments that are being made in order to uh, promote and to develop uh, more efficient and, and greener uh, ways of transportation. I think that if this tendency continues, over the long term there will be a shift which cannot uh, happen in, in a very short period of time. But all in all, uh, we are starting to see concerns and more investments and more uh, I would say, uh, effort going into alternative modes of transport. Let me ask you uh, again the question about technological unpredictability. I talked about getting locked into paths. We are certainly going to see major changes in the road sector. Electric vehicles, um, automated driving, just to name a few of the, the ones that are most uh, covered in the press. Uh, how will that affect planning for road expansion and renewal? Asking you to now put on your WRA hat. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I would say that one of the largest priorities overall worldwide in the road sector is maintenance. We need to keep the road systems working and working in a way that is economically efficient, that continues to provide access and to allow uh, people and moves and goods to move everywhere. So the, the focus here as a first priority would be road maintenance and also a very huge tendency that we are seeing today is coping with climate change. But coping not, we, we deal more with the side of adaptation rather than, than emission. So today there are quite a lot of efforts going on in different places uh, in the world. I want to come back to climate change a bit later, so I'm going to stop oh, okay. you there. But just a word, would we need different technologies if we see a major switch, for example, to automated driving for freight transport? Uh, well, automated transport is currently a concern, and we're starting discussions as to how we should uh, prepare the existing road network or the existing roads in order to allow automated uh, vehicle operations. Uh, obviously, the discussion is at a very early stage. And, um, well, we are, we're going to see more and more debate and more and more, um, well, issues uh, being happening in, or happening in this, in this area because uh, we see there is a clear recognition that this tendency will keep coming. And as road administrators, most countries need to cope, need to start thinking about what they will be doing in order to, and which technologies they will be promoting, and how they will be deployed in order to get their systems ready for this, this new mode of operation. Thanks very much. Let us come now uh, uh, back to rail and uh, ask you, Mr. Lubinu, how the kind of 
unpredictabilities and uncertainties that I mentioned affect the planning of rail extension, renewal, and addition. Uh, what challenges do your members face? Well, uh, transport is the mobility of goods and people. And there is no transport, whether you are in stable times or unstable times, without good infrastructure. Whether it is new, whether it is renovated, uh, you need first to have good infrastructure. I think it goes the same with roads. Uh, so this would be actually the priority. And I think, uh, as you mentioned, that we are actually in unstable times. We have to remember history. And it is just after the crisis of 1929 that President Roosevelt actually decided on the interstate planning. And it is just in the recent crisis that President Obama actually stated on the uh, rail planning for America. I'm taking these examples as I know that you know them well, but there is many other examples in developed or developing countries in the world where you need, especially in unstable times, to anticipate the needs to catch up and go with the growth, the expected growth. And if you look at, here we are in OECD uh, temple, but uh, their statistics are uh, announcing some growth in a globalized world. Therefore, we need actually to develop our infrastructure. So that would be the priority uh, of uh, the rail sector as well. Having said that, this uh, infrastructure must be safe, which is the first of all priorities of all operators from the inception of railways in the 19th century. Then it must be sustainable. It is already rather sustainable as a mode, but it has to be even more sustainable to bring its contribution to uh, society in terms of CO2 emissions, uh, energy consumption, and modal shift. Uh, it has also to be at the service of the customers. That was said by everybody, but this is obvious. Uh, we are not actually transporting for the sake of transport, but to uh, achieve something in a social and economical uh, context. Um, and if there is another priority, which I would say is to anticipate a little further what is coming down the, the, the rail or the roads, uh, is to be interoperable. Uh, we are not living in a world where there is still enough space, enough money to build modes independently from each other. And uh, this interoperability, which is good for international, which has been actually developed uh, uh, by air or by road more successfully than by rail, is also a strategic priority for us. Whether it is technical, whether it is uh, administrative, this is something that we must actually do uh, together with uh, uh, this new approach uh, of course, rail has a lot of advantages in terms of capacity, in terms of uh, uh, cost per passenger or ton kilometer, but uh, also in terms of complementarity. We cannot do it all. We can be a backbone of a new transportation mix. We cannot do it all. We must work with the intelligence of working together to manage the interface between intracity and intercity, between the corridors uh, uh, and the uh, first and last mile. Thank you very much. Let's now uh, move uh, into the air, and uh, Ms. Gittens, if I look at the mission statement of your organization, it mentions all four of the goals that I talked about earlier. It says uh, limiting environmental impacts while also supporting economic and social benefits. Triangulating those, of course, is not without trade-offs, and it's easier, clearly, for some of your member airports than for others. What is your advice to them when it comes to prioritizing infrastructure investment at airports? Well, first, of course, it's on. Uh, first, of course, uh, let me agree with uh, your, your opening statement about the level of uncertainty and the level of risk uh, that airports have to take in making massive, sometimes massive capital investments uh, in the face of increased liberalization of air routes uh, so um, airports can build facilities based on uh, the business models or the intentions or the expe expectations of particular airlines and a particular uh, air service market and then they can change literally overnight because um, airlines have the ultimate freedom of, of, of changing, um, changing their patterns uh, and changing their business models and we have quite a few examples of airports that built facilities 
uh, based on a particular business model, then the business model changed. You know, for example, in Asia, the, the uh, emergence of the low-cost carriers, which originally were uh, short-haul, point-to-point, then became long-distance, long-haul carriers, uh, were, were now hubbing uh, in, in their own way. Massive uh, impact on facilities, and in some cases, facilities literally had to get thrown away, that is, uh, rebuilt. Uh, the advice we give uh, to airports, one, we, we try to collect a lot of data to try to help them forecast where, where trends are, uh, both in their own market and, and in other markets, so they could see you know, what's, what's going to be likely. Uh, but we also advise them to really understand their own market and, not, and, and be careful about being seduced into a particular business model of a particular carrier. Uh, that facilities uh, need to be as flexible as possible. As you mentioned, technology is advancing. Uh, we as an association work with uh, other industry part partners like IATA, with, like with the airlines or with the air traffic managers to look at and actually help um, uh, with processes uh, technological investment uh, to, to make more efficiencies, to make facilities more flexible so it can withstand uh, some of these changes. Because the only thing we know for certain is that it's going to change. Uh, when you have facilities, you, know, you have walls and ceilings and floors, uh, it's very difficult to change them. So you have to have processes that, uh, you have to have facilities that can accommodate uh, changes in processes, particularly when it comes to security and with airline business models. Thank you very much. So one common theme I'm hearing actually from all of you is flexibility as a counter agent to in the face of uncertainty, whether it's interoperability, intermodality, inter, uh, and uh, as you say, being able to not lock in uh, whatever it is possible to keep, uh, keep flexible. Let me go now to you, Ms. Rigby. Siemens is working with governments around the world Given the uncertainties that many of them face, how can you help them identify strategic infrastructure investment priorities? Um, yeah, we are working with uh, governments on a country level or with a city level to look at these priorities. And I can definitely say this is not a, let's say, one size fits all solution. Um, if you look at countries, for instance, Switzerland, that has a very strong um, already base uh, of infrastructure, um, there we see a lot more investments going to the optimization, for instance, the, the throughput or the availability, um, for instance, um, investing in um, uh, automation for trains. Um, uh, this is important in areas where there's already solid infrastructure. Um, for instance, in Paris, we we were building um, uh, trains that were um, uh, um, completely without a driver or in our UK project in Thameslink, um, we get 25% uh, um, more additional throughput through the automated driving. Um, in uh, countries with not such a strong infrastructure base um, that is already in place, um, we suggest prioritizing highly, um, let's say, high density solutions for moving uh, large quantities of people, um, also uh, dual use and mixed transport, um, in these countries. Uh, we also look at specific uh, solutions in countries. For instance, we heard a lot um, in the last two days about the Netherlands, where um, the, the country has more bicycles than humans. <laughs> um, and in these cases, uh, also uh, solutions for, for instance, prioritizing bicycles in, um, in the, the mix of um, modes, for instance, through automated um, green phases um, on the, the traffic lights. These are very specific solutions for individual needs. Um, also, cross-border uh, solutions um, are very important. Um, this is, these are often bottlenecks, um, which, um, if they can be solved um, on the infrastructure side, this will benefit uh, both countries involved. Um, and we see that also sometimes within a country on a state-by-state -state basis. For instance, uh, Germany has just uh, shifted slightly the way that the priorities are made in the infrastructure um, spending, looking not necessarily at what's the highest priority for each state in 
individually, but um, which, which areas or bottlenecks can be optimized, which will profit uh, additional states, even states that potentially are much further downstream from where the, the, the infrastructure investment is being made, um, which was gonna basically uh, profit, more people will profit from such investments. Um, um, if we uh, this morning we had a, a presentation by our, by our mobility consultants and um, we basically go into countries and also cities and we put together uh, concepts for which of these different solutions um, can be utilized based on the circumstances in that um, country. And one additional uh, offering that we often look at uh, as, as our competitors as well is something called business to society. Um, because I think the, the return on investment just on the decisions made for the individual investment are not the only thing that has to be looked at. But of course, um, looking at the economic, environmental, social, and tax uplift in the surrounding areas from these investments is important. So with such an analysis, you can look at, let's say, what sort of economic improvements in the regions are going to happen, attractiveness for additional private investment, bringing in new jobs, bringing more customers for the regional businesses, increasing property values, um, also higher tax income, uh, decongestion in the traffic, and of course also the environmental situation, CO2 emissions reductions, etc. So with these analyses, this is also important for making these decisions for the investments. So essentially identifying positive externalities, including inclusiveness, uh, uh, the topic, uh, one of the topics we are looking at here today. So let me ask all of you now to perhaps um, dive a bit deeper in terms of climate change uncertainties. Clearly, it's going to be a major factor in the very fragile Alpine environment with implications for both road and rail and Rhine shipping. Can you say a few words about what that means for you in terms of planning and prioritizing? And who has a microphone that they could give to the federal councillor? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, you're right. I think. Uh, for every government now to uh, look uh, what means the Paris Agreement uh, for the transportation sector is very decisive. And I'm very glad we had today the resolution also from, from ministers uh, that we have general guidelines. And it's clear when it comes to CO2 in Switzerland, it's transportation is uh, responsible for about 40% of our uh, emissions. So that's a huge amount. and Much it, higher than on the global level. Yeah, mm. yeah. And well, mobility is, 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 I think, in every country where you have a, a middle class and a, a certain prosperity, you will see an increase of mobility and you will see an increase, therefore, for, of CO2 emissions. That's a statistical uh, reality. So here for us, again, public transportation, this means here especially the railway system has, cl has clearly comparative advantages for the moment. For the moment. And in 15 years, when uh, all these green cars, the e-cars, hybrid cars, other cars are available, technologies have, has all, have perhaps a breakthrough on the market that the prices are also available for people with lower salaries, then uh, the road is much more attractive, is getting more attractive, is getting greener. So for us, this means um, for the moment, this really is a, a big uncertainty. How long does it take until all these uh, nice uh, green cars are available in a larger scale? And uh, does it really help us to, at the same time, to have uh, an answer to this increased mobility? So uh, for, for, for us, it means in the next, because also uh, the planning times for uh, f f for infrastructure and the construction time, this takes you 20 to 25 years. So uh, to foresee what will be the market in 25 years, what technologies will be uh, really a mass uh, for, for, the, for the big mass uh, of uh, mobility available, this is very crucial. That's why uh, we think railway will have also in the future a very, very high uh, uh, impact uh, for the environment and uh, the cars, this will take some time until you have renewed the whole, uh, whole uh, fleet in a country and international transportation. So this probably takes 
25 to 30 years until you really can say, okay, both systems are eco-friendly and both systems have uh, some advantages also in the future. So, so that's the CO2 reduction side, but just a word, if you would, please, about adaptation. To what degree are you looking now at prioritizing resilience and what exactly does it mean in an alpine environment? Where are the biggest challenges going to lie? Yes, well, we have seen there uh, more than 50 years the model shift from uh, the lorries from road to railway. And this is exactly because it's an element of alpine protection. Uh, and here we will, well, in 10 days, we will have the longest railway tunnel of the world. That's one of our big investments to uh, have a clear orientation of uh, transit, uh, freight, uh, uh, transportation to, uh, on, on, on railway. And I think uh, what is important, we measure that. So we have uh, uh, every year a report on the envi environmental situation of uh, the Alps, but also of the cities, because I think we have to take care also about the human beings and not only about the Alps. So we, we do both and also see and measure the impact of CO2, of NOx, of other environmental uh, uh, difficult uh, elements, and then the planning of infrastructure uh, is coordinated uh, with these impacts of the environment. Thanks very much. Mr. Duane, the, the World Road Association has, adapted, has adopted a climate adaptation framework. Perhaps you could say a few words about the challenges that that will pose for road owners and operators. Uh, yes. Yes, we, we just completed uh, last year uh, uh, a project that developed a framework for adapting to climate change. This framework uh, focuses obviously on roads, on the infrastructure part, and it focuses mostly on adaptation. The way in which we do it is, uh, it, it's a, let's say, a framework that has a few, consists of a few steps. The first one is to assess the vulnerability and the exposure to risk of different, uh, of, of, of the whole road network. And then, after vulnerable and risk-exposed uh, sites are identified, what we do is uh, propose a series of adaptation measures that can be undertaken through infrastructure-related actions. Uh, this goes together with a method or a procedure to prioritize these uh, vulnerable sites according to the importance of the, of the road section in which they are located, according to the level of the danger that they pose, uh, and according to a series of, of criteria that uh, are proposed there in the framework. After that is done, then uh, we, well, we recommend to engage stakeholders and so that they are aware that these problems may exist in, in order to generate a broader kind of response, not only based on the action of the road administration, but rather on a broader consensus or on a broader uh, participation of, of people who might be affected by problems on, on the network. And after that, well, the, the recommendation is to, to establish programs that get appropriate funding and that over time can help in reducing the, the problems that uh, the road network might have under uh, storms or any kind of uh, climate change related uh, natural phenomenon. Of course, this, this focuses mostly, as I said before, on the adaptation of the network, on increasing the resilience. We want to have options, we want to, to provide possibilities for people to keep mobility uh, in the face of such an, an event. Uh, but the, let's say the, the action that, uh, that we are taking is to disseminate this framework, to, to pass it on to as many road administrations as possible, so that uh, locally people can take uh, the proper actions according to local culture, to local customs, to local exposure to, to these kinds of risks. Uh, we see that this is a major topic that will be here for, for many, many years. And um, the idea is to, well, to, to move on and to keep working so that roads can be made much more resilient than they are today. 
Undoubtedly, um, the most affected member countries are probably some of your most vulnerable member countries. What has been their response uh, in terms of the, the framework? Well, this is, this is clearly a topic that is uh, very interesting to many countries worldwide. Um, we see broad interest uh, overall, uh, but some of the countries that are particularly exposed to storms, hurricanes, those kinds of very intensive uh, natural, natural events, um, especially, for example, in, in Central America is a very vulnerable region, in some countries in Southeast Asia, um, and for other reasons, uh, here, for example, in Western Europe, there is also huge concern about, about uh, the climate change effects on the, on the networks. So depending on the geographical region and depending on the level of development of the different countries, you find that the concerns differ. But most of the countries in practically all regions of the world are concerned about the topic and are starting to take action on this, on this issue. Thank you very much. Let's go to rail now. And to what extent are rail planners and operators also concerned with potential adaptation challenges? What does it mean for your member countries, Mr. Lubino? Well, not only rail. I think that all together we have to uh, be more and more climate resilient. And uh, if it's not 40%, but globally, uh, as we said in Washington two days, ten, 10 days ago, uh, transport represents 25% uh, more or less of all CO2 emissions. And rail only 1% of these 25%. So it doesn't mean that we have to be content with this, because rail has a role to play, as I said, as a backbone maybe of a new transportation mix and bring its contribution in terms of uh, climate resilience. This is why uh, UIC, as the representative of the rail operating community worldwide, has uh, had all its members sign a, a pledge uh, to uh, commit to a reduction of CO2 emissions by 50% in the next 20 years, by a reduction of energy consumption of 50% in the next 20 years, and a modal shift, uh, wanting to follow Switzerland in this respect, uh, uh, from uh, road to, to rail, wherever it is more uh, pertinent. So uh, these are uh, the uh, efforts which can uh, bring uh, not only uh, reductions, but also in, in emissions, but also a lot of savings. Maybe we will discuss that a little later. Having said that, you know, the 50% of the CO2 emissions in the world come from 50 cities. And 2 billion people will become urbanized in the next 15 years. So the, the very big problem is there. And of course, the electric car or the bike will not be the only answer. There is massive transit and the uh, light rail transit, the metros and uh, every uh, public transportation where rail has a role to play or the rail technology has a role to play is also an essential key to anticipate in terms of infrastructure, in terms of urban planning and planification to uh, adjust to this uh, developing situation. And uh, this is what I called before the management of interfaces, the station, the logistical hubs for freight distribution or collection will be the keys of the um, most efficient solutions for uh, climate resilience. Thank you very much. Ms. Giddens, um, back to aviation. Its contribution to overall CO2 emissions clearly includes contributions on the ground. I know that you have now come up with a carbon accreditation program for airports to try to help them move toward carbon neutrality. Can you tell us a little bit about what that entails and how it's being received by your members? Uh, yes, uh, this program started in 2009. It was uh, originally specific to ACI Europe um, because of uh, various issues within Europe. It has now been expanded worldwide and now covers one third of the passenger population uh, worldwide with the, the largest uh, component in Europe covering some 60% of the passenger population. The second largest being Asia Pacific. Uh, covering some 25% of the passenger population there. And the idea is to have an independent, uh, certifiable uh, approach to both mapping, measuring, and then reducing uh, emissions uh, so that 
I mean, we, we know what we're measuring, that we're all measuring the same thing, and, uh, and airports are recognized uh, for it. And there's three plus levels, um, starting with the airport's own emissions on the ground. But moving to emissions that are done by others at the airport, but not under the airport's control, but using influence, persuasion, et cetera, to get them to, to get the other players to reduce emissions. And then uh, finally, uh, dealing with emissions off of the airport, but that are related to the airport, particularly road. Um, so getting um, uh, public transit access, you know, road or, or, or rail, uh, mass transit or, or rail to the airport uh, becomes part of the equation. And you, you know, to the extent that that doesn't quite do it, uh, then uh, getting carbon credits, so using offsets to get to carbon neutrality, which is the, uh, the, the top level. And that's the airport's uh, contribution to the overall aviation target of carbon neutral growth through 2020 and then 50% uh, reduction between 2020 and 2050. There are elements uh, at the airport that are part of the international aviation scheme. There is no scheme anymore, but you know, it, it, when there is, we part of the aviation, international aviation scheme. And that, uh, that is uh, providing ground power uh, to the aircraft, so the aircraft doesn't have to turn on its engine, and that saves a lot of fuel, um, and, uh, um, and, and providing, um, I can't remember the other one, but there, there are two basic elements that the airport can supply uh, to the airline uh, if they choose to use it. We also see some hope, and we see one airline has already, one airport has already done this, Oslo Airport, uh, in facilitating the use of biofuels. Uh, so Oslo Airport uh, has now, uh, now has through its own pipeline distribution system on the airport, now has the ability to insert biofuels uh, and has a supply system. Uh, so the airline uh, can get, can, can reduce emissions uh, by having a ready source of biofuels, which is one of the, one of the key challenges in aviation meeting the targets. But just, but just a word on the, because you didn't ask me about the um, uh, adaptation. Yeah. The other element besides the actual adaptation by the airport, and we, we like, like rail, have, a, have guidance material to airports uh, to have them assess their vulnerabilities and, and develop a plan. But the other element is what it does to their market. So you have, for example, in one of the most vulnerable uh, areas are the island states and the, the airports that serve the small island states. Well, when they have sea level rise or when they lose their beaches uh, because of sea level rise, their market is gone. And without a market, you know, then the airport can't survive either. So that's a, a huge element for us in, in terms of adaptation and, and the impact of climate change on, on the very basics uh, of the system. And often on the most vulnerable. We'll um, come, be coming absolutely. to the funding implications of that in just a moment. But let me now come back uh, to Ms. Rigby and Siemens and ask you about cities. Uh, Mr. Lubino just reminded us, uh, he didn't put it in these words, but it often is said the battle for climate neutrality will be won or lost in cities given the massive rate of urbanization and also the importance, of course, uh, of mobility, transport in cities. So perhaps you can say a word both about what has to happen in infrastructure renewal, both to reduce CO2 emissions and to reduce vulnerability, adaptation issues in cities. Um, yeah, I think what we're seeing in cities is the sort of cluster in three different areas of how, uh, how the um, climate change factors into decision making. And we're really looking at sort of at shifting, improving and avoiding in order to reduce the environmental impact. Um, if we look at shifting, um, we can also see a handshake here um, between the, the governments and the industry. For instance, um, Europe has uh, worked together with 
the, uh, the rail industry, so the European Commission, to um, develop a, a large R&D investment program um, with the, it's called shift to rail, so basically shifting to uh, lower emissions modes of transportation. Um, so that's really a handshake between private and the private and the public uh, sector. Um, what also is important in, in the shift is making these uh, lower impact modes of transportation more attractive to passengers. Um, so one thing that we're focusing on is really heightening the, the passenger experience in these modes of transportation. Um, you can look at things like um, intermodal uh, passenger information systems, or um, you can look at, for instance, we have uh, something called uh, Bebo, it's be in, be out. So basically if you register, you have a cell phone in your pocket and you can just walk into a train either between cities or within public transportation in a city. You can link other modes of transportation, be it car sharing or bicycles. And in the background, the system will just uh, book uh, the, the fees based on how far you traveled with the various modes in the background. It's very, very, let's say, passenger friendly and it will it brings people more into these low impact um, modes of transportation um, we also see things like investments in hybrid trucks I think you saw you saw it outside uh, the buildings um, the last couple of days um, where we can also transport um, goods um, along uh, corridors um, in order to also improve the environment, um, the environmental impact also for often low income um, uh, families that are living near these, uh, these freight uh, cor uh, corridors. Um, if we look at the, the improving building block, um, we heard uh, before also about um, investments in throughput and availability improvements. Um, so basically, you can improve the, the environmental impact of the systems that uh, the cities already have. So increasing the ability to transport more people and goods with a lower, um, a lower impact to the environment. So for instance, on an automated rail line, um, you can have shorter intervals between um, the trains, increase passenger capacities by up to 50%. You can have headways of about uh, 80 to 90 seconds even between uh, the, the trains. Um, and this uses a lot less energy, for instance, optimizing the acceleration or the driving and the braking through, this, uh, through these automated um, systems. You can really, um, based on the, the various uh, parameters, reduce um, energy use and improve the environmental impact by up to 30%. Um, and if you look at the new digital technologies, basically the data, data analytics and the digital monitoring of the systems, um, in order to move these people efficiently within cities, um, you have to make sure that the availability of the systems are as high as possible. And we've, we've seen systems that start out around 60 to 70% availability, and we can bring them up to 99.9% .9 availability with these new monitoring um, technologies so that the, the problems are found um, through data analytics and monitoring before the systems actually go down um, um, and service is needed. Um. So if we look at avoiding uh, the third building block, um, here we can see things like um, cities investing in congestion charging, so keeping, um, keeping vehicles with large emissions out of the cities. Um, also decisions uh, being made on things like um, uh, parking management uh, systems. It's really something that is it's actually pretty scary how much um, the environment is impacted by cars just driving in circles trying to find parking spaces it's completely useless um, and you know if there's a handshake between the the municipalities and the, the the industry there are there are solutions out there that can really reduce uh, emissions in cities by just uh, re completely eliminating the need for these these cars to drive in laps to find um, parking spaces so there are a lot of things that can be done in these three building blocks to reduce environmental impact thank you Ms. Leutard you had a comment Yes, I just wanted to add, well, I think for the Paris Agreement, we discussed a lot that CO2 must have a price. Uh, 
and especially in the transport sector, it was not possible because, well, uh, if you would have a, a tax on petrol, on, on gasoline for many countries, it's politically uh, not, not doable. But what I think has to be mentioned, we still have uh, roughly 500 billion US dollars subsidies on fossil, fu yeah. fossil fuel. And here we've seen quite a lot of countries, Indonesia, India, Nigeria, who uh, phased out these uh, subsidies and moved it to public transportation so that the consumer, he, ha he has uh, also something uh, 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 as an additional service available and he does not feel discriminated by removing all these subsidies. And so I think especially uh, for um, those countries who have here quite a lot of subsidies uh, we will see probably in the next coming years a, a shift from these subsidies towards public transportation. And second, I think also what will be important for urban areas is all this sharing philosophy. So might be cars who can be uh, shared, uh, parking lot uh, uh, apps, and I think this will also be very helpful for a lot of uh, cities to have uh, an alternative. And we know young people, well, they are more multimodal. They, they are not interested in either road or railway or whatever it is. They want to go from A to B and very fast. And so I think here the more services oriented uh, uh, applications will help also to reduce your congestions and at the same time reduce CO2 emissions. So a reminder also of the way that people think about infrastructure and how that affects uh, future infrastructure planning. Let me ask you and Mr. Dubuin and Mr. Lubinu to say just a brief, brief word about social factors because we are, of course, talking about greener and more inclusive transport. How do you figure in demographic considerations, for example, in terms of what kind of infrastructure you're going to need in future. Switzerland is among the European countries with an aging demographic. Is that part of your calculations? Yes, because, well, I think in a society where you try to be inclusive, you must consider that. And for us, it's uh, the e-mobility, for example, I think for elderly people, because it's more, it's, it, it brings up much a higher degree on, on safety. This could be a quite a good solution, especially uh, for those with short distances. Uh, I think this, the, here we, we, we will try to support with research and also projects uh, uh, where, where we start some offers uh, for, for elderly people. I think this will help. On the other side, we have uh, some programs for handicapped people. Uh, handicapped people, well, they must have also access to mobility, and here, uh, this is cost intensive, but this is part of our solidarity, of our philosophy. Transport solutions must be available for everybody. And also here, that's also some, ta some, some elements, especially in public transportation, where it's, uh, uh, it's a, a rule, a, a general principle, every operator has, has to uh, accept. And, and, and uh, also, also in the railway sector with the industry, we, the, the new uh, modern uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, the new mo modern uh, uh, wagons are planned with all these uh, uh, also social uh, aspects and I think it works and I think that's a necessity for a society to have here also an, an inclusive way and here I think uh, uh, all these also the Uber, the, 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 the taxi solutions for many people that's a more integrated way to have access to uh, uh, services of transportation. Thank you. Mr. DeWin, um, an encounter that we had not too long ago was devoted entirely to road safety. We can and must uh, do entire panels on the subject uh, again and again, but just very briefly, if you would, please, what are the implications in terms of infrastructure prioritization? Uh, make the link there, if you would, please, to the safety issue, because as we know, many, many countries are not where they need to be on road safety. Yeah, well, uh Road safety is clearly a, a problem in many countries of the world, and uh, specifically in low- and middle-income countries, there is a huge safety problem caused by the very large increase in, in motorization, 
and especially in the use of some very vulnerable types of vehicles such as motorcycles in urban areas. So uh, from an infrastructure perspective, what is being done in order to be responsive to this problem is uh, a series of activities in various fronts. One is related to the to the infrastructure itself, uh, providing better designs and better uh, signalization and, and better ways of uh, providing assistance, let's say, and, and a new concept is being developed right now in, in road design, which is that the concept of a for forgiving road, a road that allows you to make mistakes without not having a major accident, or if you have an accident, that this accident is not a fatal one. And that is one area. Another very important one is in, um, in the side of uh, driver behavior, which of course does not only depend on the road, but also on the vehicle and the, the, the attitude of the driver uh, when he or she is uh, driving a, a motor, motor vehicle. And another area which is very important is the area of institutional developments and developing proper institution, collecting proper statistics, providing useful information for decision makers to, to act, and of course, improve also the legal framework for all safety and road uh, operational issues. Would you say that the latter factors, behavioral factors, institutional factors, are in the end more important than infrastructure in terms of safety issues? Uh, at, at this point in time, probably yes, because most of the infrastructure is there, and the possibility of, of changing that infrastructure is probably lower than the probability of inducing behavioral changes and uh, having modern legal frameworks and modern laws in order to induce that kind of behavior. Hard to turn an unforgiving road into a forgiving road. <laughs> rail, what does social inclusion mean in terms of rail investment? How would it shift priorities, uh, or does it shift priorities if we take inclusiveness seriously? Well, if, if you want me to, to develop the social impact of, um, of rail, of course this is a major concern for everyone. Uh, we are not talking about mobility then anymore. We are talking, as you just mentioned, about accessibility. And that is a key issue with uh, well, the evolution of population, whether in developed or developing countries. And uh, this is something that uh, the uh, rail community uh, is very concerned about. Uh, I can give you two examples uh, of uh, refurbishment of all stations uh, for those which have already been built or anticipation of an accessibility program uh, in all new stations, uh, whether in Europe or everywhere in the world. Uh, UIC at the same time is also uh, working and developing at the moment a service uh, application that would give any uh, passenger uh, seamless uh, assistance in 15 European countries. So this is actually a, a major concern. If you want to go further in terms of social impact, we can also uh, try to uh, uh, explain the uh, added value in terms of finance of the social impact. It's true, and I'm sorry to say, but uh, statistically, uh, the rail uh, kills less than roads and the uh, social cost of all these casualties is very high for society. It is never calculated in the financial returns of the high investment of rail infrastructure. So these are things which need also to be, uh, to be taken into consideration. Likewise, the carbon footprint could also be uh, calculated, it is calculated, but it could be integrated in the uh, social return of any investment. And this, I think, is an orientation which should be in this new collective approach of uh, transportation mix uh, 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 and collaboration uh, in the uh, optimization of the, uh, best, uh, the best investment. You know, I can tell you as well that uh, uh, one dollar or euro uh, invested in uh, rail emits so to say, 100 less CO2 than uh, in per passenger kilometer as the same euro dollar invested in road. So again, I'm not saying that we are to, to be uh, enemies, but we have to think <laughs> about who has the money, public or private money, uh, and where to uh, spend it in the best uh, harmonized way. 
Is it just Socially. a coincidence that we put road and rail as far apart as they could be on this panel? Ms. Gittins, you wanted to uh, add. Well, I don't want to jump into the fight between road and rail, but I do <laughs> want to, want to uh, point out the, the demographics worldwide and the effects it's having on airport and airports and airport infrastructure. You have an aging population worldwide. Uh, you have, uh, you know, used to be old people stayed home. They don't anymore. They travel. It used to be young people with babies or small children stayed home. They don't anymore. They travel. Uh, so in addition to sort of the official persons with reduced mobility, uh, airports need to uh, accommodate uh, and enable the travel by the older persons who are less mobile. Eyesight, I can attest to all of this. Uh, whose eyesight is not as good, um, and to uh, mothers and fathers uh, traveling with young children and strollers and all of the, all of the accoutrements that come with traveling with, with young people. Um, in addition, the rise of the millennial traveler, who's exactly the opposite and wants to get through the airport and use technology. And so we need to deal with all three of those populations all of whom are increasing uh, in volume worldwide. So thanks very much. You have all depicted many different important competing considerations when it comes to renewing and investing in infrastructure. Um, at the same time, we know that policymakers and industry decision makers everywhere are facing funding unpredictability, shrinking budgets. So I'd like to ask all of you to now say a word about reliable funding mechanisms for greener and more inclusive transport infrastructure. Um, a number of attempts have been made to try to come up with innovative models, as we know, that mix public and private. Not all of those have shown the kind of results that were hoped for. So let me start out with you, Ms. Lloyd Hunter, and I'll ask everybody to keep their answers fairly short so that we can hopefully take a few audience questions after that. Well, first of all, I must say, may it be a road or a railway, what is really cost intensive in the next 20, 30 years is um, the maintenance of the existing systems. So in Switzerland, we, our assessment is that about two thirds of uh, my budget goes to maintenance. So that's your, my, my first uh, point. So here we must con con convince the population, well, you, you contribute not to a better system of infrastructure, but to to, to keep the maintenance safe and, and, and in place. Uh, in Switzerland, we have uh, since this year in place uh, a funding system, so a fund, which means really a fund where uh, a, a certain amount of the budget really goes to a railway fund and a road fund. And for me, this is this is really wonderful because, well, if the finance minister has a new program to save money, I'm safe. <laughs> so this means uh, with, with this uh, fund, we have actually the money and the planning for additional in, in infrastructure investments on the safe side. Uh, but I also here need additional money because, well, mo mobility is increasing. So this means to, to put now in place the capacities uh, which will be needed in 15 years, uh, we need additional money, maybe on road, maybe on railway. So we have an increase on the taxes for, for fuel. I'm sorry for that, but that's perhaps it's also a good uh, uh, year when it comes ne in the next two, three years when the, in general the, the petrol is so, so cheap. So uh, here we will have an additional price uh, and I think it's also a good situation because we know every new car consumes less than a car you, you bought 10 years ago. So for the consumer actually uh, it's not really additional costs but it's, uh, he, he, when he buys a new car actually uh, he's equal. But here we Will, we need additional resources and on the railway we have the same operators increase the prices for tickets because they have exactly the same situations, two-thirds or a huge amount to maintenance and when you want to have additional investments it, it needs government money and also that the, the user contributes more than today. 
Mr. Duane, the idea of ring fencing transport infrastructure funding must sound very, very attractive to you coming from a country which recently, you talked about the need for more rail in Mexico, recently put on hold a very important inner city railway project because oil revenues had dropped and the government's budget was shrinking. Um, what innovative approaches are out there? And you can wear both of your hats if you'd like, former policymaker and World Road Association, to talk about innovative funding approaches that actually guarantee the needed finance streams. Well, actually, speaking about guaranteeing the funding needed, I think that is more an aspiration than a reality. But in general, I would say that it also depends on, on which country you're looking at, because, for example, uh, a relatively new concept uh, that has been fairly successful in some countries in Central America, for example, in also in some uh, sub-Saharan countries, is uh, the so-called second generation road funds, which is a surcharge on fuel that is that goes to a road fund that is uh, applied to maintenance projects, basically. And, and I think that is a, a concept that could work in some countries uh, where there is no other option to, to collect or to obtain funds in order to maintain roads. Uh, other, other, in other places, the so-called uh, PPP, public-private partnerships models, have been uh, applied with reasonable success uh, in, in various parts of the world. For example, I, in Latin America, Chile has done a good job in, in, in that. Uh, Colombia has now a very large uh, PPP program for roads. Peru, in Mexico, we have also had uh, fairly large uh, PPP programs, mostly for roads, but also for other, other modes. Uh, but the paradox here is that even though you may find uh, funds willing to go into these kinds of projects, Sometimes or frequently you don't have the projects because you need to plan for the projects, you need to prepare the projects, you need to have transparent uh, models, uh, you have to have some very clear rules in order to, to give the concession contracts away. And sometimes uh, the investors or the funds or people who might be willing to put the money into these projects, they are not willing to do so because they don't... Uh, are quite satisfied with the conditions that they find in order to develop uh, those kinds of projects. So even though these models can be successful, I think that there is a need to perfect them and to improve them in ways that are not always directly related to the specific uh, subject at hand. They need to be broader. And then there's, of course, the, the whole question of technology. I think that today we have technologies that allow us to develop innovative uh, ways of uh, charging users and to develop new revenue streams for projects. I think we are in the infancy of seeing uh, these kinds of technological applications. But countries are working on this, and, and there is a, an ongoing discussion going on as to how we can put in place uh, technology-based uh, user charging models that can provide for an increased stream of revenues to develop uh, all kinds of projects. Thank you very much. Over to rail now, and perhaps two aspects. Pick up on that PPP, public-private partnership uh, issue, if you would like, if you have seen perhaps good best practices uh, examples. But I'd also be curious to hear a little bit about the potential of funding from green climate funds and adaptation funds. Oscar de Buen just mentioned uh, the issue of capacity building, the need for project planning that can bring projects in under the roofs of those kind of funds. Is that perhaps something that's out there for rail? And is there also a capacity building need? It, 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 it should, it could and should happen uh, more and more. Uh, you probably <laughs> are aware that uh, rail is expensive and it's very expensive and the financial return, as I said before, of rail uh, investments is, at least as it is calculated now, rather complicated to establish. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I think that rail could be considered as an investment eligible for land planning. Of course, in complementarity with other modes where they can be complementary and pertinent. Uh, this is happening. Uh, 
You know, according again to OECD figures, uh, well, 11,000 billion dollars will be spent on infrastructure of transport in the next 20 years, 15 years. This is not that big. 40% will be on rail. That is unprecedented. And this is the evidence that rail is more and more considered as a sustainable mode of investment for transport. Now you have the PPPs or the public money or the private money uh, with more or less success uh, here and there from South Africa, Hong Kong, England, France or, or Germany or Switzerland or others. Uh, I think there is, as you just said, a new mechanism that needs to be, to be found. And as we are here in a greener approach for an inclusive transport, I think uh, this is a, a solution to put on the table, uh, is to uh, bring anticipated investment from the climate resilience. Uh, you know, if you take the equivalent of savings as per life as usual, of all the efforts of the railway operating community, interurban, intra-urban and freight. In the next 20 years, this is equivalent to 100 trillion dollars. So this, I think, is in front of the financial stakeholders, in front of the political decision makers, a key factor. It is a virtuous circle of investment by investing money in rail infrastructure, again, where it is pertinent, you actually uh, contribute to the anticipated savings that rail will generate. So this, in a way, is spending the money that you haven't uh, uh, already earned, but that you will certainly earn through uh, uh, climate resilience and sustainable mobility. Mm -hmm. May I add something? Please, briefly, if you would. Because, uh, Melinda, you're, fully, you're, 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 you're right. We, ha we decided in Paris that we have, uh, from 2020, 100 billion US dollars uh, a year available, and infrastructure can be part of it. One element could be the Green Climate Fund, projects via the Green Climate Fund, which is located in South Korea. One possibility are the World Bank or um, uh, development banks, which are, are also here can realize projects, and then it's on, on bilateral projects, government with the private sector. So I think here that's a really a good opportunity, especially for developing countries who need additional investments in clean infrastructure. Thank you very much. Ms. Gittens, nearly 70% of the world's airports operate at a net loss, yet many of them are going to be needing to renew and repurpose infrastructure for all the reasons that we've been talking about. What are the funding options that are open to them? Well, what we've seen in some of the larger countries, India, Brazil, uh, as examples, is uh, the PPP system. Uh, such that the country will privatize uh, its major airports, the airports that do make money, and use those funds to subsidize the airports that don't make money. So they have a system of airports that they need to, um, they, they need to run for the good of the country, but airports typically, if, if they serve fewer than two million passengers, have very little chance of making money because of the very large capital investment that's needed. So you need a, you know, certain economies of scale to, to um, even break even. Uh, so that's been successful. Um, uh, Mexico has done it. Uh, Brazil is in the, in the midst of doing it. Uh, India is in the midst of doing it. Uh, and that's been one approach. Uh, for some airports, uh, for some countries, uh, the PPP of even single airports has been uh, successful or more successful than uh, operating the, the airport as a pure government entity uh, because the private operator will work harder to increase non-aeronautical revenue uh, and will make investments on the commercial side uh, to, help, um, to help subsidize the aeronautical side. And where none of those things work, then the, then the community, either through the government, uh, the chambers of commerce uh, have to subsidize. I mean, if they want to, to keep the airport open, uh, have to subsidize it uh, themselves uh, in order to, for the airport to break even and continue the maintenance. You know, airports don't have, uh, I don't want to use the word luxury, but they really don't have the ability to not operate in a safe and secure manner because then airlines won't operate to them. They won't be certified and um, and international, um, and they, they are not allowed 
uh, to have international routes if they can't meet certain standards. Uh, so if you want to have an airport that, that can serve your market, you have to maintain um, your airport to a certain standard. Thank you very much. Last question uh, to you, Ms. Rigby, and it concerns some of those very big rail projects that you have been involved in at Siemens. Uh, you mentioned one of them, Thames Link in London. Enormous financial commitments involved, long in advance. Uh, public authorities in England, as in many other places, are strapped. Banks don't have quite the lending capacity they did before the crisis. What are the options that are out there for financing streams for such projects? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's definitely different from case to case. Uh, it depends on how expensive is the project, first of all. What are the what does the terrain look like? What's the population density? What does the ridership uh, look like? What's the level of ticket prices? Um, that can be uh, obtained, uh, what's the rating of the country or the area that is, uh, that is uh, working on such a project. Um, and uh, I'll get to the specific example in a second, but we see even that there, there, are, there is governmental funding out there, even for instance, let's say if we look at Eastern Europe, um, and that some of these projects don't come off the ground, even though there is funding available, just because the whole financing issue is complex and just a little bit, let's say, intransparent and, and difficult to put together. So um, we basically, we have a whole division uh, that works on financing for such large projects in order to help the countries and the cities and our customers. Um, and to sort of, just to give an example of such a project, we can look at the, the Templunk um, project. So this was basically, um, about an 8 billion euro um, project and as you mentioned it was uh, let's say right uh, during the the end of the financial crisis so that certainly made it uh, a lot more difficult um, basically we as a company also um, uh, underwrote some key risks in this project and we provided um, equity um, we also took our team of um, of our financial services team and brought in private private equity um, investors um, the, the financial services group um, also helped structure and make transparent what the overall debt package would look like, uh, what would be the risks involved and how these could be mitigated. Um, and it, we ended up having, let's say, a 19 bank um, uh, consortium or a syndicate in, involved here in the in the debt uh, financing. Um, this was really, let's say, a private finance initiative coupled with a, a public-private um, um, partnership. Um, it was also, the, the maintenance program also played a key role. Um, the, the maintenance contract was um, for 20 years of maintenance, which was also a, an interesting way of providing, let's say, a stable revenue um, over a long period of, of time. Um, and I think that this sort of this handshake between the, the equity investors and putting together this debt program um, really, let's say, also the fact that we invested was uh, also in, increased the believability and let's say the, the, the way that the shareholders cooperated um, with each other. So this is something that we do around the world. Um, and again, we'd be happy to give some more information if anybody is interested in specific issues. Thank you very much. So I'd like to just take a few audience questions now. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Here I have one in the middle. Um, I know what it's about. <laughs> We're old friends. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, from the International Federation of Pedestrians. Uh, mm, we have the feeling that sometimes that, uh, let's say, the, um, the transport made by pedestrians has been privatized. So it's a sort of doing it yourself. Uh, and uh, there one thing that uh, may interest some of you will be uh, airports, terminals, train stations. What are we doing there to minimize, let's say, the suffering walking around the pedestrians? Uh, we don't know exactly if that will help to get more passengers and see more uh, sustainable transport in total, but that could be. And just one comment to Oscar de Buen. Uh, when you talk about uh, n not too many uh, new roads, uh, would it be uh, possible to think of uh, 
multi-user roads. That means also with some tracks besides for cyclists, pedestrians, and another thing, how to cross the roads mm -hmm. for pedestrians and cyclists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me come back to that in just a moment. I would like to take a couple more if we have them out there and then bundle comments. Do we have any other questions out there right now? No? Okay, then we will uh, take that one. And uh, you wanted to ask a question? Dear lady in the front row? Yes. You do. Okay, we'll get a microphone to you and we'll let them get started answering while. Um, could we have a microphone up here, please? Oh. Okay, you have a question back there as well? Here, this lady in the front row would like to ask a question. And go ahead, Ms. Rigby, I guess you had a I, thought I on that. The, yeah. the, at least give some input on the first half of the, the previous question. I mean, one thing that's being worked on also is sort of a, a beacon system. So, I mean, I think most pedestrians or many pedestrians, at least now or in the future, uh, have smartphones. Um, and I think that, uh, for instance, in the, in the railway stations, um, and if we look at pedestrians also who are also passengers at some point in their, in their travel, um, through passenger information systems, be it beacons, um, they can be guided directly to where they need to go into the next train or to the next platform without having to, to check around. Um, what's also being implemented now in the newest um, forms of transport are passenger information systems. For instance, if you're standing in a train and you, you need to know um, where to go, uh, let's say that there are a lot of other passengers coming toward you in one area of the train station. Within the train, it will show you, please enter to the right because this is less congested to get to your next spot. Um, or um, there are, let's say, signals inside the train which vary from car to car. Let's say if you want to go out and go to road crossing XYZ, please turn to the right so that it's a lot more user-friendly for the pedestrian. So I hope that will help you and your, and your interests. And perhaps just hand the microphone over there to Oscar de Buen and he can say a word as well. Uh, yes, well, with respect to, the, to your comment and your question, uh, yes, we do have a... Well, we recently, as World Road Association, we published a road safety manual and this manual has a, well, a section that is devoted to infrastructure and to how we can improve infrastructure in order to take into account the needs of cyclists and in order to take into account the needs of pedestrians. Our manual is mostly geared towards intercity roads, which of course uh, are very important for, for cyclists in many countries, not so much in developed countries, but in many developing countries, yes. And also, but, but, but it also includes uh, recommendations to improve the, the pedestrian crossings and pedestrian circulation in, in smaller urban areas. Uh, we plan to develop this tool and to keep, it, uh, to keep upgrading it. And as we go along, we expect to bring more and more good practices into all these references. Thank you. I will go to the Minister of South Africa. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I just wanted to indicate that before I, I ask my question in particular to the lady from Siemens, I would want to indicate that uh, as South Africa, we're very much excited about the latest developments, especially in our infrastructure development process, which was started by President Zuma in 2012, when he established what we call the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission. And it, for, it is actually operating also within the framework of the Green Economy Accord, which speaks to the use of alternative technology, including the alternative building materials for everything, including from housing to the different technology developments. In 2015, President Zuma came up with what is called the Nine Point Plan. In the Nine Point Plan was one of the requirements for each and every uh, uh, stakeholder and including the way we consume uh, energy as South Africans to speak to the addressing the energy challenge of our country. And we have seen 
marvelous developments, especially in the transport sector, where our rail company, in particular passenger rail agents of South Africa, has now developed a solar plant that would make it possible for them to be able to generate alternative uh, uh, energy from the coal-based or fossil-based ESCOM supplied uh, uh, coal, I mean, uh, energy, but also equally so our airports company, AXA, has now on Friday the 13th, we opened the second solar plant in one of our airports and we'll be going to the third one. And we believe in the next three years, all our uh, secondary uh, uh, or AXA-owned airports will actually retrofit to solar. We want to make sure that by 2030, Airports Company of South Africa's um, energy is at least 42% own uh, generation in particular from renewable energy, which is based on the integrated resource plan. But I, I've, I've heard uh, the inputs about the use of technology in particular to make the use of transportation safer for our, uh, uh, in, in this instance, I would talk to our passenger rail um, a, a commuters who at times a, a feel so vulnerable despite the fact that there is advanced technology. We have not been able to get to a stage where many of our commuters would subscribe to utilizing technology to make it possible that they can be able to track the movements of the transportation and all those uh, other means. I just want to know what is the role of technology companies to encourage public and members of society to, for a lack of a better word, to love the use of technology mm -hmm. in their own interest so that they can then be using it in particular for transportation. We also want to make it possible that we can use it for road safety. I know we were together in South Korea last year. We talked a lot about road safety. We went to Brazil, but still people are dying in large numbers in our a, 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 in, on, in, in, in the world. So there must be something that we can do to make our roads safer. I might not be aware of that as yet, but I would believe that there must be something that we could be doing. But I also believe that there is no competition between rail and roads with regard to this thing, because we are talking about intermodal and multimodal. So there needs to be an interface, because you need to be yes. on the road to get to the train station. And it is important that we, we even to the, to, to, to the airports or to, to the port or to any other place. But thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for your intervention. And perhaps, uh, Ms. Rigby, a word, because it, absolutely it's an inclusion issue as well, making technology accessible and usable for older people, for um, vulnerable populations. How do, how do we do that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, with, within Siemens, we also have a program called Grow Africa. And I know that South Africa is really a main hub of this, uh, also because of uh, the, South Africa is also very, let's say, influential, um, also in helping uh, the, uh, your own country, but also your neighboring countries get access to new infrastructure um, for passengers. Um, I think one thing I mentioned earlier uh, today was the whole impact of business to society. Um, actually, within our company, one um, of the main projects going on right now is a business to society project for South Africa in order to look at, I mean, you mentioned more than just uh, rail and transport, also energy solutions and things like that, is to give the, the public stakeholders, and this can be everything from the top government down to the local municipalities, information on how is this good for the population, how is this helpful, what technology solutions are out there, and to get that information out there. Because I think that, you know, of course you can say that when it's built people will use it, but I think that there's a lot of public influence that can be done just through access to information. And by making these analyses and giving that information to the stakeholders and to the communicators, we can help with that. Thank you very much. Any other question? We could maybe take one more, if there's one out there. And is there one? Oh, yes. OK. Can we get a microphone? Yeah, you have one. Good. Go ahead. Well, um, my name is Christina Yesunet. I'm he I'll be participating tomorrow in tomorrow's session, cycling as an important part of sustainable mobility. I'm representing uh, an international uh, um, 
NGO World Bicycle Relief, and we are mobilizing people through the power of bicycles. So, um, and I would like uh, to raise a question about the uh, social inclusivity of transportation. If we look at the world, there is around one billion people living uh, for less than two dollars a day, and more than two billion people living for three dollars a day. Uh, for these people, many transportation forms are unachievable. And there was one comment that I thought it was particularly interesting, saying that transportation is impossible without infrastructure. That's for many, many parts probably the truth. Uh, it's sometimes probably less important for bicycle because through our work we see in rural areas <laughs> and developing countries that bicycles are used on very simple paths um, to reach schools, clinics, jobs, markets. So my question would be, uh, what participants in the discussion, what projects see uh, or support to serve these people who are uh, uh, one or two billion people? Thanks. Well, let me ask Ms. Leuthardt, but of course, Switzerland is um, a country that is doing everything in such exemplary fashion there, perhaps not entirely representative. What's the role of cycling when you are thinking about <laughs> uh, transport developments in the future? Well, uh, cycling is, is definitely part of our uh, integrated mobility policy. So cycling, especially in, in, in cities, uh, is, is, is part of the planning. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I think every road in Switzerland has also a possibility for, for cycling uh, mobility. So I think this is, for me, totally integrated in our, it's not on highways, I must say that. On highways, I think longer distances, probably you need perhaps an e-bike, <laughs> but uh, uh, on, on uh, urban and uh, uh, rural areas, uh, cycling is very, very common. And I think we are supporting this philosophy because also it's good for your health. So you can reduce normally also health costs. So also this is supported by the government. We have it in, even in our constitution that cycling is part of our uh, um, common transport policy. And when it comes to your social idea, I think this is really for many countries important. Also in Switzerland, we have poor people, believe me or not, we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, I think public transportation again here, uh, I don't see that this is really profitable. We, we have here also the social aspects uh, that we here pay uh, a lot of the uh, infrastructure by public money, that the services are available and that everybody has access to the services also with a, with a low budget. I think that's also a responsibility towards our citizens that transport really must be access to everybody for everybody must be guaranteed uh, with or without money. I think that's a basic service uh, we need in every country. Thank you very much. And I think that I will end the discussion there um, with all due respect to the fact that we could address the cycling issue in connection with every mode represented here. But uh, given the time, I will just say thank you very, very much to all of our panelists for being with us today on the panel. And thanks to all of you for your attention and your contributions. And uh, we do now have a coffee break, I believe, outside. So enjoy that and see you at further sessions. Bye-bye. Thank you. It did.